river's channel is defined as the physical confines of the river consisting of its bed and banks. Using the example of a small section of Chalk Street, let's have a look at some practical methods anyone can use to enhance the habitat potential and natural functioning of their river or stream. Over the years, the stream had fallen victim to erosion and overwidening due to trampling by livestock and the decay of old water meadow structures. This, exacerbated by low rainfall, had resulted in low slack flows and silt covered gravel, not a happy chalk stream. In the summer of 2008, work began to gently narrow, rewiggle, and revegetate the stream using a variety of soft engineering techniques. Chief among these was the use of LWD, or large woody debris. In nature, this includes all woody material that finds its way into the river. The most impressive structures are full-size living or dead trees that have grown or fallen into the channel. Here, on the Dorset Stour, a fallen willow in the far right of the shot has created a large slack which has been colonised by lilies. The result is diverse flow rates and extra habitat potential. Here on the Hampshire Avon, a large alder has measured its length, making LWD large enough to graze a horse. To simulate this effect, convenient boughs of nearby willow trees were half cut, a la hedge leg techniques, and hinged into the channel. Here, the hinged willows on the far bank give a natural effect while creating cover, light and shade, meanders, slacks, riffles and glides, something for everyone. Other important techniques used were the use of low brushwood berms and islands. Being a somewhat loose matrix, they permit the comings and goings of creatures of all kinds, plus narrowing and pinching the stream. With a little practice they can be worked and wiggled into some surprisingly natural and fluid shapes. However, all wood rots in time, and were it not for the attentions of the local plant community, all this work would go to waste. They swiftly colonise the woody matrix, locking it together with a dense root mat, preserving it indefinitely. About eight months of growth. Here is a small island and a section of berm. Eight months later, only the prow of the island is visible through the weed growth. Here, a deep area of erosion has been packed with brushwood bundles and planted with yellow flag and bulrush. Other plants soon joined them, and some of the willow that made up the brush bundles sprouted into small saplings. Given time, this area, protected from the current by brush and plant growth, will silt up completely, going from reed bed to willow car to dry land, completely reversing the effects of erosion. In the meantime, it's a perfect home for all the little guys who need a rest from the main current. Following the creation of these and other features and the fencing of livestock away from the channel, the stream experienced a boom in plant growth over the next two years. Mature trees have the effect of shading weed out, so further alder and willow trees were planted adjacent to the channel. It is thought that a pattern of gradual felling or coppicing should produce a natural balance of weed growth with clear areas. But the trees must grow before the theory can be tested. In order to explain this mass introduction of woody stuff, I would cite the example of the stream in its wild state, say 1,000 years ago, with wooded banks, beaver dams and herds of grazing animals. The beavers would fell or coppice an area of trees, letting in light and promoting weed growth, while their dams and ponds would create habitat and aid nutrient cycling. Eventually, food supplies would be exhausted, the beavers would move on, the dam would burst, the pond drain, the trees grow up, and the cycle, a long one, would begin again, growing the next batch of LWD for later installation by the beavers. The role of grazing animals is just as important. Rather than ranging freely, 
they were stalked and harried by predators, such as wolves, keeping them tightly grouped and always moving. The effect of this would be to prevent any one area being excessively grazed or trampled. This allows the plants and soil a longer period of recovery before the next herd moves through. It's usually prolonged exposure to livestock that causes erosion. Whilst we obviously cannot completely recreate these long lost conditions, we can use some of the principles to inform the management of our rivers and streams today. Theorising aside, if there were one overarching conclusion to be drawn from the restoration of the stream, it would be of the importance of mess. Above all, rivers like mess, fuzzy edges and squiggly lines. These are the currency of modern river restoration. If there is no mess, make some. If there is plenty, don't rush to tidy it away.